Hi, this is Heidi Burgess. This is the first of two videos in which I'll talk about what I call retrospective reconciliation, which refers to the processes that are used to look back in time to past wrongs, trying to determine the truth about what happened and to provide justice for the victims and perpetrators of those wrongs. I want to start by going back to the question that I asked in my first reconciliation video. What is reconciliation? When you think of reconciliation as a process rather than an outcome, most people, I think, think in terms of truth and reconciliation commissions. Many probably think about South Africa's TRC, since that's the one that is probably most commonly known. But there have been over 40 others. However, my key point here is most people think in terms of retrospective reconciliation, much more so than prospective reconciliation, when they think of reconciliation processes. I think I've talked about John Paul Lederach's meeting place in each of the previous reconciliation videos, but here's where it really comes into play because three of his four components of reconciliation are front and center in retrospective reconciliation processes. TRCs are designed to elicit and publicize the truth of what happened in the past. They're supposed to dispense justice, and sometimes they give mercy, otherwise known as amnesty. This, it is hoped, will lead to peace, although Lederach treats peace as an input to reconciliation not an output. The reason I like his formulation so much, and particularly the teaching exercise he developed based on that, is that it highlights all the contradictions between these four elements. For example, if one focuses on truth or justice, the accused are not likely to be pleased. They may continue fighting rather than trying to reconcile. But, if one wants to stop violence, one may decide that it's best to grant mercy without deeply investigating the truth or dispensing justice. As I said in an earlier video, it's a matter of balancing or trade-offs, and it's also a matter of how you define and then how you pursue each of these components. Let's look at justice first. TRC justice is usually seen to be more restrictive restorative than retributive. That means that it focuses on restoring relationships between perpetrators and victims and healing both rather than focusing on punishment, which is generally the, generally the province of war crimes tribunals or traditional courts. However, some TRCs have worked closely with the courts to refer people to the courts for prosecution. TRCs can also dispense distributive justice when reparations are given to make amends for past wrongs. And they can dispense procedural justice when the Commission recommends changes in governmental or private procedures for treating victims in the future. An example would be affirmative action in the U.S. to try to compensate for centuries of discrimination against people of color. So the relative balance between these four kinds of justice, retributive, restorative, distributive, and procedural, can make a lot of difference in terms of whether and when reconciliation is achieved and, if it is, what it looks like. The definition of justice, I should also note, is very culturally influenced. Some religions and cultures focus much more on guilt and punishment and others focus more on redemption and change. So deciding what wrongs even are and how they should be dealt with is by no means a universal cross-cultural kind of thing. There's also a question about the limits and extent of individual responsibility. Should people be held responsible for doing something that the leader told them to do? or for espousing attitudes and behaviors that they learned from their parents, from the community, and from their schools as the right thing, or at least the acceptable thing to do, even when norms change and that behavior is no longer seen as right by the people who are now in power? 
How often is the source of evil more destructive conflict dynamics than it is the character of the person? For instance, what in-group, out-group hostilities grow even stronger and stronger due to the behavior of people on all sides is someone who just follows the behavior of, of others around him evil? Where do you sus assign guilt and impose punishment in that case? Guy and I argue that a lot of what is thought of as evil in the world is actually more the result of destructive conflict dynamics than it is evil people. And if you can agree on that, then you'll have a common enemy in limiting those dynamics. On the other hand, if you focus on evil people and hold them all to account, that can raise a lot more difficulties because those evil people are likely to see you as evil too. So then you end up with a destructive power contest between people who hate and fear each other. Isn't working together to improve conflict dynamics more attractive? Now I should be clear. I do think that some people are truly evil. People who care about no one or nothing except themselves, particularly when they're in positions of power that require them to care about and care for others. People who are sadistic, who take pleasure in other people's pain. I agree, that's evil. And it's not going to try work to try to work with such people to diminish destructive conflict dynamics, because they're probably trying to accelerate those dynamics, particularly if it allows them to gain power in the process. So that's not the kind of people I'm talking about. Rather, I'm talking about people who are their victims. A lot of people who voted for Trump, I believe, didn't do so because they were evil. They did so because they were victims of his disinformation campaign. Now, while I'm asserting that many people who voted for Trump were victims of his and his allies' disinformation, I do not agree necessarily that they're victims of big government or liberals or the dark state or the system, as many of them assert they are. This book, The Culture of Complaint, points out that it's psychologically much easier to think about your problems as being caused by somebody else, and it's their fault it's not your own shortcomings. It's also fun to complain about the other. How much time do we all spend sitting around with friends, reading and posting on social media about all the outrageous things that the other side has done? And we gloat about all the virtuous things we have done to counter them. That just reinforces the notion that if the other side would just go away, remember my reference to Into the Sea Framing in an earlier video, or agree to our own world view, then everything will be fine. Well, that's a sure way to make nothing fine. And we all still do this a lot. Now, going back to the meeting place, let's look at truth. Truth has never before been so fraught as it is now in the U.S. and indeed all over the world. It's been frequently observed that Trump supporters and progressives live in completely different information universes. I found myself wondering how so many people, over half of Republican voters and 147 Congress people and senators, really believe that Biden stole the election, when the evidence is so clearly contrary to that view. Then I realized the question, answer to that question is clear. Most progressives read the Washington Post and the New York Times. They listen to NPR and they watch MSNBC. All those news sources explained how all the states counted and certified the votes. Over 70 courts heard cases challenging uh, those declarations. And in all but one case, the courts upheld the validity of the reported outcome, confirming that Biden had won. But what I realized was that most Republicans never saw or heard any of that. They heard from Fox News and Newsmax and Rush Limbaugh and the president himself that he, Trump, had won by a landslide. And if Trump, their esteemed leader, said that, and if their news outlets repeated it over and over, that was true for them. Why would they doubt it? 
Those same news sources told them the election was stolen by illegal ballots and compromised voting machines and intentional miscounting. That's all they heard over and over again. Their social media confirmed the same stories. Why would they believe anything different? So why does this matter? It matters not only because it delegitimizes Biden's presidency in our democratic system more broadly, but in this context it also matters because it's a huge impediment to the successful creation or conclusion of a truth commission. Why would the people who think Trump won the election and that climate change and COVID are fake believe the testimony given at a U.S. Truth Commission? Why would they support the notion of reparations? If they don't, even a truth commission, even if a truth commission were formed and held, its products, such as transcripts or reports or recommendations, likely wouldn't have enough legitimacy to be implemented. The goal of most truth commissions is to create a shared narrative, one that all people on all sides of the conflict understand and agree to. So before we create such a truth commission, it seems to me we need to figure out how to get all sides of the political spectrum to participate and in it and to validate the results. Now I'm not saying that it cannot be done. Once again, Boulding's first law, if it exists, it must be possible, is true. Truth and reconciliation commissions have been done in many other countries some more successful than others, of course, but they've been done fairly successfully a number of times. It has also been done internationally and in the U.S. at the local level, so it can be done again. But figuring out a process that is seen as legitimate and establishing a national narrative that everyone in the U.S. can agree to is going to be a significant challenge. Mercy is another very difficult concept. Many, including people in South Africa, fault the South African TRC for granting too much amnesty to the perpetrators of heinous crimes, thereby shortchanging justice and letting perpetrators off the hook. Both Ibrahim Rasul, who I mentioned in an earlier video, and Dr. Fanny Dutois, who is the former executive director of the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation in Cape Town, South Africa, who I saw in another video recently, stressed in their respective talks that amnesty was given quite rarely by the South African TRC. Not all the perpetrators were tried for their crimes. There were way too many to do that, but they weren't all officially forgiven either. However, if mercy or forgiveness isn't offered for perpetrators, what's going to impel them to step forward and tell their story? Some do so simply out of guilt or strength of character, but many, or maybe most, won't do that. So what can you do if people won't admit their guilt? Many people argue that one should forgive anyway, even if the perpetrator doesn't permit admit their guilt because forgiveness is for you. It sets you, the victim, free. In 2005, one of our graduate students, Kate Malik, interviewed Linda Beal, who was the mother of Amy Beal. Amy Beal was in South Africa on a Fulbright, Fulbright scholarship in 1993, where she was helping to develop voter registration programs. She was driving several of her co-workers home when her car was stopped by a mob of angry youth. Despite protests of her friends, the mob attacked Amy, bringing her, uh, beating her, and finally stabbing her to death. As Kate wrote in her profile of Linda, the mother, Amy's story could have ended there. Instead, Linda and her late husband, Peter, returned to South Africa. Slowly, South Africa became their full-time careers and an inextricable part of their lives. Today, Linda divides her time between the United States and South Africa, running the Amy Beale Foundation, now called simply the Amy Foundation, that she and Peter started. Two of the men convicted for Amy's death are now her close friends. 
Although Zelinda's story is extraordinary, she also believes it was the only thing she could have done. Forgiveness is something for you, she says. It releases things in you that set you free. It's not for other people as much as for yourself. Reconciliation, on the other hand, she said, is active. It takes work. Forgiveness is a release. Generally, it's assumed that forgiveness should not be granted to people who do not admit guilt and who do not apologize. That certainly was true in the South African Triassi, although admission of guilt and apology often were not sufficient to earn amnesty. So the questions that have to be examined are, when is mercy or amnesty to be given? What form should it take? And how should it be balanced with truth, justice, and apology? Linda's a remarkable woman, but she's not at all alone. I googled forgiveness can set you free and found hundreds of such quotes. Many were from Christian sources, but others were not. For instance, there's one here from Buddha. But there are many people who understand that forgiveness is more for the person doing the forgiving than it is for the person being forgiven. After looking at many such quotes, I found one that seemed most useful in a medium post by Tony Falkry, who presents himself as a self-empowerment author, speaker, and coach. In his article, he says, Forgiveness does not erase the past, but it looks upon it with compassion. To withhold forgiveness keeps emotions of hurt, anger, and blame alive, which discolor your perception of life. To forgive, avoid ruminating on thoughts of being wrong. Rather, trust the power of forgiveness to heal the hurt and the pain. By holding on to pain and resentment, you suffer because the sorrow is intensified to keep it alive. Despite people's perceptions that forgiveness means to forget, its motive is preserved in self-forgiveness and the role played in co-creating the circumstances. That doesn't mean you consented to what transpired, Given your involvement, even as a victim, you need to forgive yourself regardless of your role. Forgiveness means to let go of hatred instead of allowing it to eat you. Forgiveness removes fear. That is why it is such a powerful weapon. The reason I'm elaborating on this so much is it strikes me as part of the answer to the question that one of my students asked me before the course even started. In an email exchange before the course, he asked, how can you reconcile with someone who doesn't want to reconcile with you? As I thought about my answer to the question, I realized that was the, the question I was asking myself as I was advocating reconciliation in the U.S. political conflict. Here in the U.S., very few people are interested in reconciliation. Even most of my conflict resolution of friends assert that it's too early. First, they need, we need justice, they say, or first we need truth. I agree. We do need justice and we do need truth. But we also need mercy and peace because we need reconciliation most of all to avoid that hurricane I talked about in the Prospect of Reconciliation video. And while we will talk about the order in which these should be pursued in a little bit, that's actually part of the meeting place exercise, I would assert that we need all four together simultaneously, or perhaps even if we're going to try to reconcile with someone who doesn't want to reconcile with us, we need to start with mercy. Mercy is closely related to an idea the conflict scholar and friend of mine, Lou Kreisberg, presented in his BIS essay on de-escalating gestures. I usually call them de -arming, disarming gestures, as you'll see in the title of this slide. But since Lou was a scholar of the Cold War and disarming meant drawing down nuclear weapons, he prefers the term de-escalating. But it's the same thing. 
The notion is you do something that surprises the other side because it's more reasonable or more helpful or more conciliatory than they would expect you to be, as they see you as the evil enemy. I remember talking about this in a recent video in reference to Anwar Sadat's visit to Jerusalem. Very recently, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman talked about the same thing in his column on January 19th, in which he discusses how we can move forward together after Trump. I didn't put the title of his column in this slide because it's kind of inflammatory, but you can read it if you want to in the references. However, the ideas in the column are excellent. In it, he wrote, To me, the most striking feature of Trump's presidency was that year after year he kept surprising us on the downside. Year after year he plumbed new depths of norm-busting, lying, and soiling the reputations of everyone who entered his orbit. But he never once, not once, surprised us on the upside with an act of kindness, self-criticism, self -criticism, or reaching out to opponents. His character was his destiny, and it became ours too. Well, he said, I've got good news. We can recover, provided that we all, politicians, media, activists, focus on doing what Trump never could, surprising each other on the upside. He continued by saying, Upside surprises are hugely underrated force in politics and diplomacy. They are what breaks bonds of pessimism and they push out the boundaries of what we think is possible. They remind us that the future is not our fate, but a choice. To let the past bury the future, or the future bury the past. And then he goes on to talk about Anwar Sadat as well. So back to the question how you can reconcile with someone who doesn't want to reconcile with you. The answer I would start with is you surprise them from the upside. You do something friendly or helpful that they're not expecting you to do. Now, if neither party wants to reconcile, as we see in the United States at the moment, the challenge is even more difficult. But usually there are some people who understand the benefits of reconciliation and forgiveness. Biden maybe does, or maybe he's just playing to politics with nice words. I don't know yet. But I would argue that those of us who do understand the benefits and power of forgiveness and reconciliation need to try to sell the idea to skeptics with stories of hope. Stories of how it has worked for ourselves and stories of how it has worked for others. When I taught face-to-face -face at the University of Colorado, I always showed my students a long night's journey into day, which is a documentary about the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it features, among other participants, Linda and Peter Beale, along with the young men who killed Amy. It's an immensely powerful movie, and I found out you can now rent it for 48, for 48 hours for just $3. It's on Vimeo, and the link is in the uh, references page. I highly recommend it. The last component of the meeting place, of course, is peace. Peace is not so much retrospective as prospective. And in this sense, the meeting place is not just a retrospective exercise, but a prospective one, too. I particularly like the way John Paul describes the relationship between all the elements in his meeting place theory and exercise. Reconciliation, he says, can be seen as dealing with three specific paradoxes. First, reconciliation promotes an encounter between the open expression of the painful past, on the one hand, and the search for the articulation of a long-term, independent future, on the other hand. Second, reconciliation provides a place for truth and mercy to meet, where concerns for exposing what has happened and for letting go, in favor of a renewed relationship, are validated and embraced. 
And third, reconciliation recognizes the need to give time and place to both justice and peace, where redressing the wrong is held together with envisioning of a common, connected future. Chip House, who wrote the essay on reconciliation for B.I., quotes Desmond Tutu as saying, Reconciliation isn't cozy. Chip went on to say in his words, not Tutu's, It doesn't come quickly or easily. Indeed, achieving anything like reconciliation normally takes years or even decades. And in a country like the United States, whose racism is etched into its entire history, the first signs of reconciliation will also have to be constantly reinforced and nurtured if we want the chance to survive the challenges and setbacks we will inevitably encounter along the way. I'm going to stop here because this video is already very long and I'll continue this discussion in Retrospective Reconciliation Part 2.